Good evening, Mr. Prime Minister, and welcome. Um, and thank you for everybody coming out on a chilly um, pre-Thanksgiving evening. And Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much for coming to Little Rock. It's a pleasure and an honor to share the stage with you this evening and to give you and the audience a preview of what I'd like to cover with you this evening is um, we'll cover how you got started in government in Pakistan in your home country, some of the problems that you helped solve. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the security situation in Pakistan and the surrounding area. Um, we'll uh, dig into the economic development efforts that you led in Pakistan and um, we'll focus in particular on some of the investments that China has been making in your home country. Um, and of course, we'll talk about your home country's relationship with the United States of America, if that's all right. So, um, as uh, Dean Rutherford was talking about, you had had a very successful career with Citibank. Uh, you were at the pinnacle of international and global banking. You had a nice, cushy office in New York City, and the phone rang one day, a private jet and all the accoutrements, and the phone rang one day. There had been a change in the government in your country, and you were being asked to come back and, and assist. So tell us about that. What happened after that phone call? Oh, after the phone call. <laughs> I was totally uh, shaken, to, to put it mildly, because I had uh, the person who called me was General Musharraf. I had never met him. and. And didn't know him or any of his uh, um, senior generals because uh, there was no reason to really. I had no interaction with them. I was uh, busy in my own world and uh, as I reflected on what he said, uh, and it was a sort of lengthy conversation, he explained how the economy of the country is in dire straits and uh, he has taken over. I said that I know because I had seen it a few days before on CNN, and um, he said, we need somebody who's global and professional to come and fix the economy and get the investment going and get uh, the reform agenda going. So I said, well, I'm honored that you've called me and uh, let me discuss with my bosses just the fact that I should come even and see you. And uh, if we come to some arrangement with my people, I'll come and see you, that doesn't mean, and he also said that, that doesn't mean I'm offering you any position yet because we'll be talking to other people also. And it also didn't mean that I'm uh, accepting anything at this stage, it was too premature. So I went and saw him and met all his colleagues, uh, the other generals, and uh, uh, this was the first time in my career I had ever been to the army headquarters. There was no reason for me to. Uh, in Pakistan, a lot of people lobby in different uh, uh, halls uh, or different uh, powerful buildings, but I saw no reason, no reason to. So I didn't know any of them, actually. Even General Musharraf, I had never seen his, him ever. But uh, since uh, he was uh, running the country at the time, and I, as a good, uh, loyal, and uh, strong citizen of Pakistan, I went uh, and met him. And uh, he said, as you know, we, our economy is uh, in dire straits. I said, that's an understatement, but yes. Uh, why did it reach that stage? I think it was a combination of many things. Uh, uh, not uh, having the right team, I guess, not uh, doing the reforms on time, staying, you know, economic management today is not a domestic issue anymore. You live in a globalized world, whether you are in Little Rock or in Islamabad or anywhere else, there are linkages which create opportunities and challenges for you. Uh, it's not just restricted to the economy, but since we are talking about that part of my life, so I, uh, talked to them and I said, okay, let me go back to New York and talk to my bosses and see what we can do. Uh, and to make a long story short, my chairman at the time, our chairman, we had two chairmen because the bank had merged. Sandy Weil, who was the Travelers Group chairman, and John, John Reed, Reed. Uh, yeah. who was the Citibank chairman and remained the co-chairman for a, a couple of years after that. And I discussed with them and they were all very excited. In fact, when uh, uh, 
I had met them actually even before I left that this is what I'm doing. And they said, why don't you take the bank plane, it'll be… I said, this is kiss of death. He said, why? I said, if I land there with a company plane and, you know, with the press watching and um, all those other things, you'll have… before I even set foot in the country, there'll be editorials of lifestyle and what have you. So anyway, I took a commercial flight and um, I was impressed by General Musharraf's uh, sincerity in trying to get the uh, economy back on its rails. And I did sensitize him to the enormity of the task. It was not as simple that you just bring in somebody, you know, and the world will change overnight. It doesn't work that way. Uh, so, and we didn't know each other at all. So, uh, there was a bit of trepidation on both sides. But anyway, uh, so, uh, John, uh, I said, uh, what I'll do is take a leave of absence if I'm offered the position. Uh, for wow, a year. So you thought you might come back to banking? Yeah, of course, because I, in, in my uh, core is something called professionalism. It's not politics. So professionalism means you do the right thing, you are transparent, you have high standards of integrity, no matter what you do, and then you lead that life. Politics is a bit different, but you know, uh, changes do happen as your life, as you navigate through the various challenges you face. So, I accepted and I took leave of absence and I came as finance minister. Situation was much more, much worse than I had imagined. And while people were, the good news was that the people working there in the finance area were very good. But uh, obviously, uh, they did not uh, the environment was such and the other challenges were such that we couldn't really get to where we wanted to go. So my, uh, I'm assuming you'll ask that, so I'll say it anyway, my whole philosophy of changing a very troubled economy, a sick economy, to life well, can be described in three words, the, print, the sort of core principles I had from on day one, and I said this publicly, on many occasions, because every day you had some public event once you were in government, that uh, we will uh, liberalize, deregulate, and privatize. Three words which had a lot of depth and meaning, and I explained each one. Liberalize because in a country like Pakistan, the involvement of government and red tape and policy making and rules and approvals and no objections and rubber stamps on every, there are six rubber stamps on any decision. And I don't know why we were so fond of rubber stamps, but now technology has moved on beyond that. Uh, so that was very important to deregulate because the more you regulate without knowing what you're doing, it becomes a culture. And it also gives rise to uh, the potential of corruption. Yes. Because if you have to go every time and get six approvals, you can create uh, more problems for yourself. Uh, deregulation, because we were uh, a product of the British Raj and a colonial sort of environment coming through, and the standard thing by government was control it, regulate it, never let the hundreds of flowers to bloom and the entrepreneurial spirits to come out uh, to their full potential. Of course, they do come out in any environment. So that is very key. And deregulation, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, does not mean abdication by the government. People misunderstand the concept sometimes, no fault of theirs. Uh, government's role is always there to oversee and be the overseer. But you don't have to be in everybody's office or in their decision-making process. Create the enabling environment which will let the entrepreneurs and the business to boom and move ahead and get the best results for themselves. And when somebody has incentive and they feel it's a fair environment and you have freedom to operate, that's when you get progress that you can see here and in many other countries in the world. So that was my… and privatize because uh, you know, they are state-owned enterprises in the socialist system. They are uh, uh, private sector and, uh, approaches to, the uh, to running an economy. But uh, in my considered view, 
the future is to allow the entrepreneurial spirits of the people work, they produce the best results. There may be some uh, industries or sectors where the investment required is so huge or it is so complex the government may have to come in. But more and more that's not needed, in fact. So I always used to say it's not the business of government to be in business. It is the business of government to create an enabling environment for private sector and public sector if it exists, but private sector to grow and take the economy forward. And the government's role is to be the uh, policy maker, the uh, overseer, and making sure uh, transparency is there, making sure governance is good, making sure nobody's taking an, uh, 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 an advantage of the government and its policies where we were not, uh, where that was not the intention. And of course, fighting corruption and fighting. So in our culture in, in Pakistan, the, uh, what I felt is that if you are in government and you have a lot of authority, which as you know, the finance minister, which I was, is absolute power in terms of economic decisions. The finance minister is the most powerful minister in the cabinet. He chairs cabinet committee meetings. In addition to the prime minister, the only minister who chairs cabinet committee meetings is the finance minister. And those committees have authority to approve everything. So you are empowered, there was no question about it. So we went on this program and the other thing I realized, which was a real shock coming from the private sector, was that we, had, we were under an IMF program, the International Monetary Fund. And if you want to lose your sovereign, economic sovereignty, the best way is to get a program from the IMF. <laughs> you, are this, you are a victim of bureaucracy par excellence. You are uh, my way or the highway. There's no discussion. Uh, that's the approach they have. And uh, I'm over I'm exaggerating this point a bit to just to show you. And the whole government and bureaucracy then becomes a victim of all this, and they try to manage the system. Uh, uh, but it's not the fault of the IMF to behave this way. If we manage our economy well and we govern properly, there's no reason for you to go see the doctor and get the medicine, which is not very pleasant in terms of. Uh, uh, so the. Uh, reason but you were you were able to restructure the debt of your country though and working yes, with the yes. IMF and the world that was just one part of yeah but that was a major part because the debt service payments were enough to take away the whole budget uh, nothing left then to for and salaries nothing left for development and growth we wanted to see the growth going so I rescheduled uh, the debt over several years and the uh, United States helped a lot. First, I convinced the Treasury uh, uh, Department here, then I went to the IMF and World Bank, uh, because the U.S. is uh, the major shareholder of these institutions and they carry a lot of clout. And luckily, the people we are dealing with in the State Department and Treasury understood what the plan was. I explained to them what we were trying to do, liberalize, deregulate, privatize, etc. And uh, so we got uh, away mm -hmm. with it. Uh, the debt burden had to be pushed out because uh, ideally it should have been written off, but politically for countries who are donors, they don't like to lend money and then write it off. So I came up with this very simple but innovative way of pushing the debt out 30 years, 10 year, 15 year grace period, reducing the interest to almost nothing. Now those of you who know present value accounting, will easily guess what I'm leading to. If uh, that meant that uh, you pay back, you get a 30-40% haircut if you follow this formula. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't something ultra complex, but that's and, what… And it gave time to the economy to be able to absolutely. grow, to be able to service the debt. That is the key point I was absolutely coming to, that that gave me the space yeah. to then implement other reforms and try to get growth. Because nothing works if you don't get economic growth. Right. Even a developed country like the United States, if your growth slows down or disappears, you will see the pressure building in the economy and mm -hmm. the people. So we wanted growth and then for the eight years, we had six to eight percent real growth in real terms, uh, which uh, got us to uh, doubling the size of the economy in about 
six to eight years if you compound all this. And uh, the best gift you can give to a nation or the people is to grow the economy. Now there are issues when you have growth, you have to try to get equitable growth. You don't want the rich just to get richer and the poor get poorer. So that rebalancing also has to be created and there are many techniques of doing that. And how did the privatization work um, yeah. with respect yes. to yes. equality and, and spreading good. the assets? Yes sir. yes, sir. Very good question. So we decided a list and announced it. All this has to be transparent, that these are the sectors we think the government should be out of uh, uh, this business. And uh, we had to do it. Because in Pakistan, I guess the culture is such, if you sell a state asset, everybody thinks you're selling it to your cousin or your uncle, and it's not, maybe the past may not have been transparent, although I don't, I didn't check each transaction. But we wanted in our case to do something different. So for the, we were uh, issuing licenses, new licenses for something in my pocket. This is called a cellular phone. We had one and a half network or two under invested, old technology, and this is one of the best engines of growth because it is empowerment, it is connectivity, it is so many things. I don't want to get into this, I'll be speaking for half an hour. But so I said, What do we do? And you could see the press building up in a very um, negative way on privatization. The unions were not happy. The civil society said, hmm, will they give it to their uncle, cousin, or brother? So I said, okay, what we are going to do, we, uh, we wanted to give three new licenses for cell phones. So we hired some, we did something which the government had never done. People thought I'm going wacko, but no, it worked. We hired the ballroom of the local Marriott Hotel, that was the only hotel in Islamabad which had a big ballroom. And I told our people that we will auction new licenses for… Uh, first I asked, what did we p get for the old licenses, which was before our time? And the, bureau or the people I asked, senior bureaucrats who had the history, they just looked down. I said, well, tell me, why are you so shy? He said, nothing, sir. We allotted them. I said, but did the government get, because you know, bandwidth is a scarce resource. It's, it's not uh, an unlimited resource. I said, we must get something for it and we should do it transparently. So what I decided is, first of all, in our country and in many countries, when you bid for a government property being sold, a lot of people come in with fake bids and just to muddy the waters and all that. So first pre-qualify the buyers, because if you sell your phone system to somebody who doesn't know how to operate it, you will get the flag. So we had to do some sort of pre-qualification that you had the financial and technical resources to run a, a franchise like that. So we got the best experts to do that, outsourced it, not the government doing it. And secondly, we said to enter the auction, you must put at the door, bring a cashier's check of $10 million because this license is worth a lot. If you don't even have ten million dollars to put as a deposit, you are just a letterhead company. You know what a letterhead company is? Yes. You go to a printer, say ABC Enterprises and you know, nice logo, <laughs> there's nothing behind it. So I wanted to avoid all that. Mm -hmm. And I told the state television company to live show to the nation how we are auctioning these licenses. And by the way, next day everybody, the press was quiet because we showed it on TV live. We got 350, I forget the exact number, million dollars per license, or maybe slightly less, but it was big. And it was shown to the whole country, people bidding, doing that. It wasn't my uncle or cousin, or, because that's the standard thing. And you have to fight these things because if you want change yeah. for your country. So we did all that out of the box stuff and we succeeded. Uh, of course, coupled with this was a lot of economic growth coming. So the phone system, we created thousands of jobs. And then the private sector comes in because each, you have to buy the phones, uh, you have to buy the chips, you have built, uh, built towers all over the country. Uh, you have, in our country, you, even the towers, you have to have security there. So one guy, three people uh, uh, shifts uh, around the clock. All these jobs were created and people had connectivity. It was amazing. It was like giving, you know, 
uh, sweets to everybody every day because they could talk to each other and it led to uh, more economic growth because it's opportunity. And, uh, so, so things were going fairly well. You had restructured the debt, the economy was growing, yes. you were bringing transparency into the, um, into the government and trying to tamp down corruption. Um, and then something happened that brought the attention of the world to your part of the world, 9-11. Oh, yes. <laughs> and the relationship between your country and our country, my country, changed a bit. Absolutely. There was that famous phone call from Colin Powell to, uh, president. to the president. Yeah basically saying either you're with us or you're against us. Yes, absolutely. I remember that very well. And you guys said you were with us. Uh, yes, because obviously we are opposed to extremism and terrorism. And uh, the call did come. And I think it was not just really the U.S., the world wanted U.S. being an important yes. player, of course. And, a, uh, you know, as you know, the Pakistan-U.S. relationship is a very complex relationship. We are the most sanctioned country we were, and I think we may still be, uh, a, a sanctioned uh, ally of the United States and the most allied ally of the United States at the same time. So we are a member of, and we are a non-NATO ally, we were a member of CETO, CENTO, going back to the Dulles era, you know, and every treaty we signed, and then, at the same time, we were sanctioned because of where there were reasons on yes. both sides, which mm -hmm. I need not go into at this point, but uh, it was a complex relationship. Yes. So we then, I was in government, so when this happened, of course, Colin Powell and Tony Blair, who was uh, sort of an interlocutor too, because Britain, be, uh, it was uh, felt that they understood Pakistan also quite well. So they were regular visitors and coming, and we, you know, no country in their right mind would ever say that we, want, we are encouraging terrorism and extremism because if that happens, it hurts the fabric of the country. And so you have to fight it, you have to find ways. But the problem in the world, uh, preempting maybe your question, uh, we don't spend enough time on root causes of... Yes, I, I wanted to talk about okay. that. And in particular... Uh, <coughs> Many people say that bombs, bullets, and bayonets are not the answer to the root cause of the problem, and that you have to attack the root causes of deprivation and helplessness um, and lack of a well-rounded education right, right. so that young minds um, are uh, infected with um, thoughts that lead to terrorism. Um, and within your country, um, let's focus on the education system for a while sure. and, and its role in changing the country and, and moving away from um, a ground from which terrorism might grow. Um, how do you go about looking at your yeah. educational system? Because I think many have said that it's one of the problems. Yes, yes. I think back to uh, what you alluded to and you've re read the book too, I guess. I talk about the deprivation uh, issue. Uh, I believe that terrorism and extremism stems from deprivation, which I then define in the book, which is uh, lack of income, lack of justice, lack of human rights, lack of, re lack of resolution of disputes. It's a very holistic uh, way of looking at it. And it is not a policing issue. Terrorism cannot be solved just by policing. You will have 20 more, it's like shoots growing, 20 more, every time you take out one, there are 20 more. So we have to understand why people behave this way, why are they willing to kill themselves, what, what is motivating them and what can we do to make life better. So uh, that's the way we have to look at it. And uh, in terms of uh, what you are alluding to as to why Pakistan has this or what we can do about it, I think it's a very complex uh, issue. This really, in Pakistan, we, uh, the, the growth of extremism and terrorism happened after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. When they walked in, we were part of a coalition, United States, ourselves, and many other countries, to oppose that. And uh, it was decided that rather than send uniform forces into Afghanistan to fight the Russian army, Soviet army actually at that time, 
<coughs> this predates uh, 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 the, uh, Russia coming into it on its own. Uh, we will send uh, volunteers. So there was a movement to recruit people from within Pakistan and from the rest of the Muslim world and pack, sort of package it as a religious war <coughs> of this a communist nation coming and attacking a brotherly Muslim country like Pakistan, uh, like Afghanistan. Obviously, that could. Uh, there were theories that maybe they wanted access to the warm waters of the Arabian Sea. That would involve Pakistan and all sorts of things. There may be some truth in it too, uh, but uh, that's what happened. So volunteers from uh, people who were students, people who were working, they signed up. They went to fight uh, for Afghanistan. Now, as we have seen, history will tell us it's happening even now, today, where we get people, uh, we help people to defend themselves and uh, train them to defend themselves against forces who are trying to disrupt. Uh, the entry strategy is worked out with some thought, but there's no exit strategy in these conflicts. And that is why we are seeing problems way beyond Pakistan. You look at the whole Middle East area now, uh, Syria, Iraq, Libya, etc. We can talk about all these too, uh, because I have points of view on most things, and these included. <coughs> but back to Afghanistan. So we sent these people, they were coming from the Middle East, from Saudi Arabia, from the Gulf, from this, that, and Pakistan recruiting was going on, uh, encouraged by the United States, by Pakistan, by everybody. They were all party to this. So if if you hear otherwise, please bring the person to me and I will remind them what we discussed. So, uh, that being the case, uh, the, uh, the Soviet forces had a tough time and they finally had to withdraw, if you remember. So, the uh, Taliban, as it was called, Taliban means student, which means young fighters. Uh, they did an effective job in containing the thing. Uh, now, once that happened, there was no strategy to rebuild Afghanistan. This we see in many conflicts, yeah. that you get rid of the aggressor, but you don't do anything about the, the, the debris which is left behind. There seems to be an aversion to nation building after nations are... Uh, after you know, nations are, yeah. Attacked. Uh, attacked. And, and uh, the people, also the people who go and fight for them, they have then nothing to, nobody takes care of them, we're all to blame. So, uh, these young kids who are now uh, coming back to normal life, we don't do enough to retread them, to package them, to mold their thinking into the, that, that battle is over. Now you come and learn a skill and earn a job, I mean get a job and get back into normal life. We just abandoned them. And that's how a lot of these terrorist groups, in hindsight, and we are all to blame, were created. Because they felt used and uh, suddenly they are abandoned. And then, of course, as you know, in every society there are negative feelings. Uh, there are people who exploit these things. The other issue, which allow me to move a little to uh, what I call reform by regime change that became very popular. That was the next phase after the sending people to contain, say, the Soviets in this case on Afghanistan, etc. So we said, okay, you take, you know, a uh, country, you don't like the leader, you don't like the way it's run, and there are good reasons probably for that. So let's eliminate him or her. So we eliminate the leader. And then the country implodes because there are regional factors. Take Libya as a great example. <coughs> so the world decided that Colonel Gaddafi has to go. For whatever reasons, I won't get into them. And so he was eliminated. NATO forces actually went and killed him, you know. And if you see the NATO, uh, allow me to be blunt. Well, with the support yeah. of the Arab League, the, uh, asking the West to come yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, no, no, of course. Right. But NATO was used, the Arab League was part of the thing, absolutely. But I think NATO should have said no, because to kill a leader of a country, even if you, he, you despise him, he's bad, evil, you don't send NATO fighter planes shooting. Now, at that time we all said, gee, maybe this is the right thing, we meaning the world. 
not us, but the world. Uh, when that happened, what happens after that? The state implodes, the country implodes, factions take over, uh, there is no writ of government, and the country becomes a terrorist haven because all these elements come there. One, they are disenfranchised. Two, they then use this as a base. And I don't want to comment on any one, uh, one leader because that's really not the purpose of this discussion. But to tell you how by ta removing the fabric without much thought of leadership or the, or the sort of um, governance system in that country, good or bad, uh, we create a vacuum. And these uh, situations are exactly what uh, the people who want to create trouble are looking for. They are hoping that the system will react that way. Uh, you look at uh, uh, Levant, Syria, Iraq, what's going on? Uh, we can discuss each one of them in detail, but that's not really, I don't think uh, we have the time. But these, uh, it's very simple to say, you know, we are going to eliminate this or we are going to do that. But we must also be conscious as to what the after effects will be. Yes. Of and now we have created, now when the fabric of the state collapses, Terrorism, extremism gets a power boost like you've never seen. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is happening as we speak, right in front of us. And uh, we are trying. The last point I would make on extremism, terrorism, is that it is not a policing issue. You will never solve extremism and terrorism by just killing everybody. You will solve it by... Uh, doing, approaching the issue differently, which is uh, winning the hearts and minds of the people. It's very difficult to do. It's a very tough recipe, which I'm just giving. But that is the ultimate way to retread these people back into a normal life. And that's where we, we collectively as the world have failed. Uh, and we need to do more to uh, get this issue uh, taken care of. And regime change is the start of the problem, not the start of the solution. Uh, so we have to be very careful how we uh, sit and decide whether a certain country is now. And there are probably very bad leaders there. No, I, don't, I don't want to, probably. Uh, I don't want to get into that. But uh, the way to tackle that, we have to come up with a smarter way. And we can discuss those two. So we have a new president in our country who's getting ready to take office. And if you were in his office, we'll give him a couple of weeks to get used to the job. Um, towards the middle of February. I think he's already on it without even, yeah, in, in which your, is good. And you were behind closed doors with him. And he asked you to speak very frankly about specific things that the United States could do to um, yeah. try to turn the tide on terrorism in our world. What would your advice be to the president? Well, uh, first of all, I would tell him that uh, get a coalition of countries to do it. Don't just proceed as a U.S. policy only. U.S. has many friends and admirers, but they are also many adversaries, right? Because of uh, all uh, whatever reasons. So, if if it's done collectively with a group of countries, including from all faiths all faiths, so it's not seen as a we they, uh, that's step number one. And I think most people, I've, I have a lot of friends in the U.S. administration, uh, and once in a while I talk to them, and they, are, they would welcome that. Why should U.S. be the only uh, sort of uh, country which is criticized by all this other side? It's, uh, it has to be collective. If it's for the betterment of the world, we should get a coalition of the world together, including Islamic countries too, and others who all want peace and harmony. And uh, that will reduce the pressure on the U.S., number one. Europe should play its part. Nothing, today, if you ask me what, what uh, in the world worries you, is the division between the major powers of the world. There was always tension, they have different agendas, they have different ideologies, but on such issues we should bring them together. It's, it's very interesting, uh, if we can, in the fight against extremism and terrorism, if we can get Russia, United States, of course United States, Russia, China, Europe, 
all on one page, it may not be easy. Your firepower gets much more enhanced. Today, in the world, the P5, or the P3 really, of P4 as you call it, P4 and P5. P5 means the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, which are US, of course, Russia, China, uh, France, and Britain. Europe's role is less today, but it's good to have them on board. So if we can bring them together, then a UN tribe, the UN actually in all major crises in the recent past has been MIA, missing in action. You look at the migrant crisis in Europe, huge situation. You never saw UN move one way or the other. It was countries well, moving. Let me be very direct yeah. here, because <laughs> nations know how to send in their militaries to do certain things. But we've talked about how um, policing, to use a more polite word, yes. or uh, an invasion, to use a more direct word, is probably not the only way to address the problem. No. So putting aside the military efforts, what are the specific <coughs> things that you would recommend that the president consider building a coalition around? I mean, yeah, what should the be done? The first thing the president should consider is building the right coalition. Okay. Going it alone, I, as a friend of the United States, would never advise them to do ever, because the backfire will come all on the U.S. and you're doing it for the cause of the world. It's not just because of the U.S. So, and Russia must be on the table, China must be on the table, and of course one or two European powers, and then one or two Muslim countries. You know, they have to be very much there, so that it's a collective effort. And that is half the, that solves most of this problem. So it's not America's war against uh, uh, somebody, a refugee camp in Timbuktu or wherever it is, but it is the world, sensible people in the world want to fight extremism and terrorism. And uh, they should be together. If we don't do that, it gives the other countries who are not on the table an opportunity to create problems for us. And that will happen. So it is the job of leadership, Mr. Trump, President Trump, to engage with the leaders of other countries. And he already has a good relationship with Putin. You see, whether you like it or not, Russia is a big power, China is a big power. You got to find ways of dealing with each other. And they have to find a way to deal with the United States and Europe. And what will be the end result? The end result will be good for everybody, humanity. Nobody will compromise their positions. Nobody will give territory to anybody. Nobody will increase or help increase the sphere of influence of any other major power. But peace is what is needed. Uh, uh, and that we should do before the problem arises. Usually we are reacting, as you see. We are not preempting. And there the UN can play a part. And UN was always missing in action. Even in the migrant situation where people were being killed, crossing borders, there were no camps, they were out, not there. That is not the weakness of the UN alone. That is a failure on part of the five major powers who run the UN, the permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, they should have been on the front foot and empower the Secretary General support him or her, as is now him, uh, to come up with a solution which appears to be, you see the, the optics of the situation are as important as the facts. It should be seen as a collaborative effort to help the world and get rid of those elements who are creating trouble. If a particular country does it, then they become the target and we lose the battle. We may win the battle, but we lose the war. So that's where leadership comes in. And I think that if Mr. President Trump can focus on that, it'll be... Now, they say, I read in the press, that he knows Putin well. If that is true, he, can, he should use that card to uh, and get the Chinese in and get uh, the Europeans, of course, they, uh, they should be in. And yes, there was Crimea. Yes, there are many things on all sides which the other side doesn't like. We can get into that debate ad nauseum and nothing will happen. So leadership means to choose the right issues and to choose them in a sequence and in a way which is participative also. And gone are the days where one can order 
every, the whole world, we will, you will do this, you will do that. I mean, love to do that, but it doesn't get traction. People will say yes, and by the time they get into their car on the way home, they've decided something else. So, um, President Trump should focus on these three or four leaders and really get to uh, work with them, and he can be a game changer. Because he's an entrepreneur, he doesn't have baggage, he's got, he can fix things. And I, I really feel this is a golden opportunity because every day a life is lost anywhere in the world, irrespective of whether we like the country, we don't, these are human beings and they matter. So we should, that should be the thing. Secondly, of course, for Mr. Trump, or President Trump, sorry, would be uh, healing the wounds domestically because after an election you have different feelings, and I'm sure he'll do that, that now he's the leader of the United States and leader of the free world, but he's certainly leader of the United States, so he represents all factions and all people. So some healing, some touch, some uh, humane stuff coming would be very good. And people like strong leaders. People like pe uh, leaders who are active and trying to do the right thing, and this then will spread globally. Uh, so some of the problems which you started with terrorism, extremism, is a major, pr it's item number one on the agenda of many countries. And that's what we should, uh, President Trump could be the game changer here, I really yeah. feel. He doesn't have baggage. He's not hostage to anything. He can do the right thing. He came from the private sector. Absolutely. As, as did Absolutely. you. That's why I'm excited. Yeah. Um, let me shift to uh, back a little bit closer to home, to Pakistan, and the relationship with India. Yes. And there has been conflict in the Kashmir region for quite some time with the line of control and lives right. have been lost as recently as this weekend. Um, you're both nuclear, admitted nuclear powers. There yes. was a submarine, um, an Indian submarine apparently uh, was in Pakistani waters. Till we, caught, we saw it and, and we and told it, them go away, otherwise the, we pressed and, the button. And, and the Navy pushed it away. Yeah. Um, Done very maturely, I must say. Yeah, and you know, you're, Pakistan has bought the latest attack helicopters from China, and there just seems to be a lot of muscle flexing in this region. Should yeah. we be concerned? Yeah. Where is this going? Just the last point first. The attack helicopters are defensive. You don't go into battle with helicopters these days. You do, but that's after you've captured the territory, etc. And uh, Chinese. I, I'm not. I'm not making an accusation. No, it's, no, it's, it's not. It's just that there's a it's lot. It's a of activity. defensive weapon. Yeah, it's yeah a lot yeah. of activity. Should but, we be concerned? Uh, yeah, uh, the. I think Pakistan. Uh, first of all, for countries in the world, especially in the area we live in, buying stuff to improve our defensive capability, is the when you take oath as prime minister, or president of the country, it is your duty to make sure you have enough funds allocated for that. Because we live in a very tense environment. And I do believe one thing, peace can only be achieved with strength, not weakness. If you don't have enough capability to defend, your, defend yourself, and you're negotiating or you're in a situation where two countries have differences, if there's weakness on one side uh, and strength on the other, it will create more problems than it will solve. So, the other thing on India-Pakistan, very good question. I don't want to go into the history because most people would know, but just to say that the current escalation of tension is because of trouble in Kashmir. Since Mr. Modi's arrival, uh, Mr. Modi is the Prime Minister of India. He was elected and we welcome that he's uh, sitting there. And, but he has some baggage. And I, I'll be frank, you allow me to be frank? Yeah. So he has some baggage. In his time, uh, in Gujarat, his state, Muslims were butchered under his watch. Now, that is mm -hmm. point number one. Point number two is that when I was prime minister, so I remember this very well, a train of Pakistanis visiting India, we have a train service, with, it was the train was stopped in the middle of nowhere, the doors sealed and b the train was burnt mm. with all people inside, everybody was burnt alive. Now when I tell people that, I say, really? 
Or I said, just Google, you'll find. I was in office, so I called Mr. Manmohan Singh, who was the Prime Minister. Mr. Modi was Chief Minister of Gujarat, the state where this happened. So I said, Mr. Prime Minister, this is really uh, a despicable act. And we are sitting in the 21st century. You stopped the train, locked the doors, burnt women, children, everybody died. And people, when I say this, they say, is it true? I said, just go and check it out. And all Mr. Manmohan Singh told me, I'll look into it. I said, Mr. Prime Minister, so many lives have been lost yesterday. <laughs> You're just looking into it. You should be telling me what you've done already. I mean, I said it more diplomatically, but... <laughs> so, uh, anyway, coming to the current situation in Kashmir, there are UN Security Council resolutions when Kashmir had conflict for the first time, saying that immediately as peace is restored, we will have a referendum. The people will decide whether they want to go stay with Pakistan or go with India. Because, you know, uh, there was a... Uh, when the British were leaving, they had this thing that majority... Uh, the rule... Uh, the principle was that majority where Muslims are there will go... And if it's contiguous, obviously you can't go... Uh, you can't have enclaves everywhere. You could, but it would not be practical. But in contiguous areas, if there's Muslim majority population, that comes to Pakistan. And the, uh, if they are majority non-Muslim, they go to India. So, uh, those resolutions are there that a referendum will be held, like Brexit. Hopefully the results will be <laughs> more predictable. And uh, that has never been done. So that's the sore point which has been its uh, resolution of the UN Security Council passed by everybody, mm. the permanent members, uh, etc. Uh, so this is some of the baggage. The good news is that in the time of Prime Minister Bajpai, who was from the BJP, the same party, uh, not Mr. Modi's party, but uh, similar to Mr. Modi's party, sort of ultra-right, slightly extremist view and anti-Muslim sort of a, uh, DNA. Uh, but Mr. Bajpai came to Pakistan and I was in the room. I was just finance minister then. For some reason I was there. And we came very close to a deal on Kashmir. He agreed, we agreed. And the interlocutors were the British. British, the Britain, uh, British people or government, and uh, they understand Pakistan a lot because obviously they were, we were a colony of Britain. So they know the nuances, they know all the undercurrents and what have you. So they helped, and the United States, of course, we kept them in the loop and they were very supportive. They supported it all the way. Uh, Mr. Bajpai, who I think will go down in history as one of the great leaders of India, he's very unwell. Uh, he made one, I, and I was in the room, he said, look, we won't implement or announce anything till after my re-election. The election was coming because he, came, he comes from an ultra-right, very uh, ultra-right party who normally would not support this, but he saw the light. But he says, as soon as the election is held, and if I am still Prime Minister, we will implement it. And he's a sincere man who wouldn't say it if he... Unfortunately, they lost the election. And Congress came in, which is a milder party, but uh, they didn't have strong leadership who was willing to stick their neck out domestically. And with the ultra-right party now in opposition, they would exploit that. So we, have, we are stalled again. As regards buying helicopters, our defense budget is peanuts compared to India. Our defense expenditure is a rounding error when compared to India. For us, it's a lot of money, but in the overall scheme of things, and we, we have no desire to fight a war with anybody, leave alone India. We must have enough capability, though, to defend ourselves. So our whole defense strategy is if they get more weapons, which they get every day and sophisticate, they're buying Russian weapons, French, US, everything. Uh, we must have a deterrent capability, that's all. So we're not bullied and pushed around. And so those helicopters and, 
you know, whatever we have, this is routine stuff. Mostly these are uh, for, they are gunships, but they are used against terrorists and they are used in uh, uh, natural calamities and disasters to evacuate people. Uh, and they are not the most modern in technology, I might add, compared to say US helicopters, which we used to have, they were very advanced. So that's the real issue. The need for peace between India and Pakistan is critical. The need to solve the Kashmir issue is critical. And uh, it will only be done, it will only happen when there are strong leaders on both sides. It will, if you have one government very weak and one very strong, you will Qu never Which solve leads it. me to my last question before we take some questions from the audience. Yes. Um, and you probably know where I'm coming from on this, yeah, from agree. the grin. Under what circumstances would you consider getting involved in politics in your country again? No, I, I'm not a politician. I went in, I'll tell you why I went in, because the country was bankrupt, really. We had negative reserves. I'm embarrassed to tell you that, but it's well known. We had more payables than account money in the bank. And that was no way for a sovereign country, a nuclear power to live. So. That's, it was not difficult to convince me. Although I left a very good career in Citibank, and as you know, uh, we are paid very well in banking. <laughs> we still are. I gave up uh, a huge six-figure number every year. But money is not everything. If you get an opportunity to serve your country and your motherland, and you do it not for money, you do it because History will respect, regard you and the judge, people judge what happened and the results were there. From anemic growth of two, three, four percent, we, as I said, doubled our GDP. We got rid of the IMF. Never happened. The happiest day, one of the happy days in my career as Prime Minister was when I went to Parliament and told them, today I have an important announcement to make. They so said, oh, what is he doing? Is he leaving? Is he what? I said, before coming to the parliament, I instructed our central bank to remit this much money to the IMF today, value today, and repay our entire debt to the fund. And then I said, today Pakistan has regained economic sovereignty. This is the only time the opposition clapped in my four years. <laughs> Usually they booed us. But you know, they, they couldn't help doing this, sort of half-hearted clap, yeah, but clap yeah. was there. Yeah. Uh, they bang the desks, that's the way they do it. So, the point is, uh, one must never, uh, the graveyards of the world are full of indispensable people. Nobody's indispensable. And once you move on, give others a chance. I think that's the sign of greatness. To say that uh, I go back, I was never a politician, I don't probably want to be, but I helped my country and we made a big difference And governance, uh, fighting corruption, economy, etc., etc. All improved. Uh, but uh, we, there are many other people who should come through a normal process of elections and democratic process. Uh, what we did was an anomaly. It worked, but it could have also failed. But it worked because there were sincere people on all sides trying to do the right thing. Uh, having said that, I think the solution for Pakistan is a, a democracy, a democratic government. But in my book, as you will see the last chapter, I have strongly advocated a presidential form of government. Why? If, I, if you'll give sure. me two minutes, I can. But the reason is in a parliamentary form of government, the cabinet and the key player. Cabinet is your first line of defense or the last line, depending how you look at it. Uh, it should have in ministries area experts running the ministry. In our case, uh, the criteria is very different. It's, uh, you know, coalitions being, respon being responsive to, okay, we'll give you this ministry, we'll give you that, and uh, it may have nothing to do with qualifications. What Pakistan needs, like many other countries, so if you're getting a finance minister, you must get the best finance person you can find. If you want an education minister, you find an educationist, not a chap who's not even a BA, or maybe he has a false degree or whatever. 
and they are running education because their objective is not educating people. The health ministry should have, and we have such people in the country, should be the health expert. So in a presidential system, the president has the authority to appoint the cabinet. The parliament, if you are a member of parliament, you legislate and you have oversight on the government. And that will get stronger because you get the MPs there. And there are examples of countries, Indonesia, Korea, Korea these days has issues, but the system is presidential. And uh, many countries in the world, developing countries, have presidential systems. Uh, the idea is to put the best talent against the opportunity. And uh, if we don't do that, then everybody will become an MP to try to be a minister and try to enrich themselves. I'm not saying all will do that, but some will do that. So to get the move, nation moving forward, you must get the best people in the country in that field and put them there transparently. Nobody's cousin, uncle, dad should be, say, oh, our family has been in politics for 50 years, so my son should be a minister. This was my biggest challenge as uh, people coming and saying, make my brother or make me the minister of so-and-so. I said, what do you know about mining and uh, energy? He said, nothing, but I want to be minister. I don't want to say the rest of, uh, describe the rest of the conversation, you can imagine. <laughs> I, I, I was appalled, but that's the true fact. So we have to get a system of governance where we put the best talent there, have very strong check and balance, and ruthless transparency, ruthless, then we'll see progress, then we'll see action, then we'll see. And I've said that now in black and white, last chapter, the way forward. To It gives a little uh, road map of how to do it. Excellent. Thank you. Let's thank the Prime Minister for being with us this evening. Thank you very much, sir. We do have time for maybe one or two quick questions, and so if we get our hands up, we can get a question. We have Khalid, a student. Yes, uh, my name is Khalid, and I'm a, a second-year student. Uh, Where are you from, sir? I'm from Afghanistan. Ah. Uh, uh, Prime Minister, thank you for coming to Little Rock. Uh, my question is, uh, from uh, the Taliban inception in, in 1996 until September 8, uh, 2001, Pakistan was, uh, as a government, was supporting uh, the Taliban movement and uh, had a, one of the three countries that recognized Taliban uh, had a dip diplomatic relationship with uh, Taliban. Uh, September 10, things changed, that's 2001, and Pakistan um, changed the course and now recognized Taliban as a terrorist state and uh, radical. So how would you explain that to the normal common person? Yeah. Uh, I'll Thank explain you. it to a smart person like you, and then if you buy it, then uh, I hope others will buy it too. No. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that we joined a coalition to support uh, the Afghan government and people to fight Soviet expansionism and their whole plan to come, I think, plan was to come to the warm waters of the Arabian Sea. Uh, and uh, the U.S. helped us. They were part of the coalition, of course, a leading part, and many other countries were involved. However, uh, now uh, Taliban is, uh, of course, uh, from an organization which is fighting for freedom of its country to a terrorist organization where they are attacking us, they are attacking your government, the same people on the... The border is porous, so... The person who's in Peshawar today could be in Kabul uh, tomorrow and they can be coming. And other factors, other countries have come in who are seeing this uh, sort of disequilibrium or this group of people and they're exploiting, exploiting it to meet their own needs. Other countries have come in to use the Taliban to create trouble for Pakistan. Other powers are also doing the same in Afghanistan. And this, could, uh, this is what's happening. And the people mostly don't know who's behind it. So uh, in Pakistan's case, we feel very good about what support we gave to Afghanistan over the last decade. We lost lives, we shed blood, we opened our homes to them. Millions of refugees came in to Pakistan. It created, a lot of people were opposed to it because, you know, 
they were in any… when you have such mass migration, first of all, the slums of our big cities expanded dr dramatically. Secondly, these people needed the UN aid and all that was not enough for them to survive. So they took jobs and displaced the local people. We said, no, this is a extraordinary situation. Many, as rightly expected, married locally, settled locally, they don't want to go back. Not everybody's a terrorist, they're good people too. So we opened our hearts to them, we opened, and I think this was our duty, it was not our favor. And we will do it, God forbid, if it's needed again, it will be done again. However, uh, now those very Taliban are attacking our establishment because they are encouraged by other fact, other powers who have scores to settle with us or whatever the reason. And so now uh, dealing with Taliban for us is today there are explosions taking place in Pakistan directly linked to them. The border is porous, people are going back and forth. We have evidence, we have shared it with your government, they have, uh, we have shared it with our friendly countries too. So we will have to collectively do it because this could, this is also a threat to your government. In fact, there are attacks taking place in uh, Kabul and other cities of Afghanistan which doesn't make anybody happy. Uh, I personally, when I was Prime Minister, went, no Pakistani Prime Minister in the history of our bilateral relations has made so many visits to Kabul as I did. And this was not for sightseeing or ceremonial visits. Uh, I used to go spend hours with President Karzai and uh, many other colleagues in his government, Hidayat Amin Arsala at that time, many others. And uh, now you have an elected coalition government. I'm not there, so I can't give you the latest, but I do keep in touch with… I met Mr. Ashraf Ghani a few months ago. We are good friends, so we meet one-on-one. -on -one. Again, trying to, although I'm not in government, trying to see how we can build bridges and uh, reduce the trust deficit or improve the trust deficit and reduce this uh, feeling of uh, what are we doing and why are we not doing. To me, the Afghanistan-Pakistan relationship, above any other relationship for your country and ours, if we get it right, the dividend will be huge for both. No other country can match that dividend uh, and returns of the relationship. Unfortunately, there are forces at work which don't want that to happen. But I think better sense will prevail. Uh, every time there's an explosion in uh, Afghanistan, they try to put the blame on people from our side. When we have something, we try to… So it's deteriorated the relationship a little bit. But I think uh, the, both countries need each other and we should… both should show… I'm not involved day to day, so forgive me for not… Uh, getting into… I have some idea but I don't want to uh, spend time on it, except to say that both countries should show maturity and learn to live with each other. Uh, Afghanistan is landlocked, no matter what plans our adversaries have to change the geography of the region, it won't change. Uh, all transit, you can… it comes through Iran and Pakistan and there's a lot of affinity of the Pakhtun population, particularly with Pakistan. And there are also people who don't agree with it. Then there's the Panjshiris, the Hazaras, etc. Hazaras are uh, uh, also very good people. The Panjshiris have their own view. I don't know your origin or your ethnic background, but that doesn't matter. You're an Afghan and that's more important to me. <coughs> so these three subgroups have their own internal challenges also. Which I think when you have challenges internally, there are forces at work in every country which will try to exploit them. So I think all of us, Pakistan included, should… we should show more leadership, more openness and see how we can work together. I believe maybe I'm biased because of my background and I've said this publicly in Kabul many, many times, that the economic integration of the two countries <coughs> is critical to sustainable peace and growth going forward. And I worked hard to achieve that, as you know. And the roads, uh, I went in fact with President Karzai to open the road which we built from Khtorkham to Jalalabad. And there are many other things we did and we can do much more. But uh, it takes two to tango, 
and I'm quite confident that in time better sense will prevail. Our friendly countries also have recognized this and they are trying to uh, uh, sort of get things together. Also, it, domestically, like any country, you have a democracy and you have internal divisions within your government which are not uh, below the carpet, they are out in the open. So that will also help. As a friend of Afghanistan, the differences can continue but they must agree on three or four key things and get it moving as a one country. Otherwise, uh, you, you know, when you're pulling in different directions, as, uh, as I said, as a friend of Afghanistan, that will delay things and you will be looking for more issues like what we are looking at today rather than positive things we can do together. Thank you. I know that there's uh, many more questions. I do hope that you come up after the event and, and chat with the uh, Prime Minister while he signs a copy of his new book. He won't hawk it, so I will. It's over here for sale if you'd like uh, to continue this conversation. Jerry, Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much for visiting with us, and thank all of you for coming out. Thanks again.